I am currently the director of the program, uh, buildings program at uh, the Pemina Institute. We are a uh, national uh, clean energy think tank. We do have offices across the country. Um, I work out of our Vancouver office um, on the traditional territories of the Squamish, Mus Musqueam, and Tsleil-Waututh uh, peoples, which of course is also home to many diverse First Nations, Inuit, and uh, Métis people. It really is um, a pleasure uh, to have been asked to moderate this, this group. Um, the, the work that I've been able to do with uh, social housing providers has just been absolutely humbling. Um, I'll never forget when the pandemic first hit and we we're trying to get folks at BC Housing and Metro Van Housing and you know, trying to, to do the things that we're doing and they're saying, we're just trying to get groceries to people. And I just, the, the heart that goes into that work, I just found completely overwhelming and inspiring. On to um, our hard parts. Um, we know that without a doubt, the buildings are contributing to emissions, uh, Canadian emissions. So it's about 12% nationally, and in some cities, I'm thinking particularly about Calgary, that's as high as 65%. We also know that the buildings that we have today, up to two thirds to three quarters of them, will still be in operations uh, by 2050. So we, we, we can't ignore them, they have to be part of the solution. The numbers are pretty staggering. Um, <clears throat> Josephine mentioned um, some numbers that actually Maddie Kennedy uh, <laughs> worked on uh, some, uh, a couple of years ago for the BC. Uh, that number is about 600,000 homes we have to be um, retrofitting or de decarbonizing um, every year, starting immediately. Uh, that's about 4.5% of the total building stock. Currently we retrofit, really renovate mostly for kitchens, uh, less than 1% uh, of our building stock. This is a, a, an incredible um, uh, hill we have to climb. But it's also scary about, you know, when we think about what if we don't do anything. Um, this is a, a graph by the Insurance Institute of Canada. And uh, what it tells us is that since the 1980s, severe weather claims paid by the Canadian insurance industry doubled every five to 10 years. Um, and that's about, uh, recent losses are about 20 times what they were uh, in the early 1980s. So the ways that this is appearing in Canada, we've already seen a hint of this. We all very well know uh, what was going on in, in BC in uh, 2021. But the wor in the words of Environment and Natural Resources Canada, not in 26 years of releasing the top 10 weather events has there been anything comparable to 2021, where Canadians endured such a stream of weather extremes. By the way, BC was in four of those top 10 that year. The property damage from weather cost Canadians millions of dollars and the economy billions. And perhaps more immediately, we've talked a little bit about this already, the connection um, you know, directly with people who are living uh, in conditions, whether they be because of the houses that they're living in or the um, um, socioeconomic condition, conditions that they're in. Um, poor buildings impact our health. They, um, they impact uh, or they can cause sick building syndrome. They can aggravate respiratory diseases and allergies. Um, we know now better than ever that they can transmit uh, infectious disease, diseases and vulnerable populations are particularly susceptible to this. Um, um, the, the next level to that is the, the kind of the age and vintage of housing that is most affordable tends to also need the most repairs um, and uh, is, is housing these particularly vulnerable populations. And it's going to be expensive if we don't do anything about it. You know, from an asset uh, value perspective, we're, buildings that aren't going to be climate ready uh, will have property value decline. Uh, we've already talked a little bit about the recovery costs if we're not ready for coming climate changes. We're seeing insurance premiums go up, or worse, not even available to people. Um, we're seeing that particularly in the in, you know, places where fires and floods are happening. Uh, there are calls for having climate risk disclosure, which is going to change how um, you know, the calculus of what's affordable and what's not affordable. We're seeing utility rate escalation that's far and above what the um, consumer um, price index is. And of course, we have a climbing carbon price, which I understand as of April 1 is now $65 per ton. And key to this is getting beyond simple payback. We know that energy savings can't pay for this. Um, what we're doing is we're, we're over, um, <clears throat> overburdening things like energy savings to, to try to pay for it, and we're undervaluing the additional benefits. We have uh, an opportunity to synthesize these things, and this, these buildings 
we want to touch them once. We want them to la have another lifetime of, uh, of service. We want to not only make them energy, more, uh, energy efficient, but also to drive down the carbon emissions that, that come from them and take this opportunity to make them healthier and safer, to make them more resilient both to uh, seismic risks as well as to climate risks. Um, and then there's an opportunity to help them be integrated with the utility um, uh, service that, that's needed um, to help with um, providing reliable um, 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 energy grid services. Again, the numbers are staggering. There are benefits, though. Um, the modeling that um, uh, we did a couple of years ago suggests that with uh, um, elect you know, energy efficiency as well as electrification, we have an opportunity to actually release some electrons that can be directed to uh, electrifying other parts of the economy. Um, this, we, we have the opportunity to drive down carbon by as much as 90%. That is, that is what I did by switching to a heat pump. Just switching my, my space heating to a heat pump, it reduced my carbon by 90% in my house. Um, and then we have this opportunity to build out um, um, our economy and locally. So where the houses are is where we're, we're going to need jobs and we're going to need materials and we're going to need um, uh, product development. Broad sweeping, you know, there are few of you in here that are going to think that this is news. Uh, we need to be ensuring equitable access to the benefits of healthy, safe, resilient, low carbon homes. Um, we need to be protecting renters from unaffordable rent hikes and rent evictions. And we need to be targeting vintage housing that is often most affordable and most carbon intensive. The utilities have to participate too. The rate structures need to actually drive building decarbonization um, and while they're recognizing and maintaining affordability. And we need a modernized grid uh, that facilitates fuel switching. You'll often hear um, big building owners having to do electrical upgrades and the, the neighborhood benefits from that electrical upgrade, um, but the benefit or the uh, cost of it is burdened by the building owner. Um, and simply put, we need to stop funding furnaces and, and boilers, which uh, has already been suggested here by Margo. That's kind of an overall perspective on how Pemben is going to look at it. Um, what I'm really excited about is everything I'm going to learn from you folks. Um, we, we are looking for what is the balance between regulation and incentive uh, to, to make sure we are balancing these, these benefits and costs. If you want to hear anything more from me, you're welcome to reach out. Um, we'll be releasing results from uh, the Reframed Initiative, which has been our deep retrofit um, program that we've been running oh, since Dylan was there uh, uh, for a, a while now. So it's um, seeing some really exciting results out of that. So now it is my pleasure to introduce our panel.